partner and senior talent strategist, Carly Dye, with us. She also supports the nurse residency program. We are also very excited today. We have three of our current nurse residents joining us today for this session. So at the end of our presentation, we're gonna have them come on. They will introduce themselves and then they're gonna share what made them successful during their application process. So as we're going through the slides today, um, be thinking about maybe some questions you might have for them regarding this topic. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about who is Stanford Healthcare. So Stanford Healthcare is a large academic medical center with more than 300 facilities throughout the Bay Area. We are the only level one trauma center between San Francisco and San Jose. So to get a, size or a sense of our footprint, we are over, the 500P campus alone is over 800,000 square feet. We have um, over 15,000 employees here, and of those, 3,500 of them make up the clinical nurses. We have 101 ICU rooms. We have 53 operating rooms. We have 605 licensed beds in total. Um, we have 450 life flight transportations annually. And then we see over 72,000 emergency room visits each year and, and another 2 million outpatient visits per year. So we are a large academic specialty medical center. For the nurse residency, we are a nationally accredited transition to practice program through the American Nurses Credentialing Center, so that's the ANCC. The ANCC sets the standard for uh, nurses transitioning into practice. Our comprehensive one-year program includes 350 plus hours of clinical training, plus seminars to support the successful development of newly graduated nurses. Our program is very thoughtfully designed for highly motivated, determined, and compassionate individuals. Our overarching goal is to develop competent, compassionate, committed nurses who make a positive difference in the lives of our patients. So part of how we meet this goal is through our curriculum. And we utilize Vizient's Nurse Residency Program curriculum. The curriculum was developed by Vizient, who also partners with other academ academic medical centers and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. It was developed during a time of need when many new nurses were leaving their role within the first year of their career. The residency program curriculum was created with a goal in mind to support new graduate nurses in their transition to practice. Our program isn't an extension of nursing school, meaning we're not gonna reteach what you've already learned. Instead, we're gonna teach you how to apply those skills, all of your background and your experiences that you've had, and then we're gonna build up on those. We teach you how to apply those in the clinical setting. So within the program, we use these three principal domains. I'll touch on each one briefly. Leadership is the first one. And here we cover conflict resolution, patient care coordination, professional communication, and then resource management. So within this, we talk a lot about decision-making skills and prioritization. And then under the communication umbrella, we talk a lot about um, giving and receiving feedback and then delegation and escalation. The second category is patient outcomes. Here, we're looking at how to manage the changing patient condition and how to respond to those conditions, those um, situations and not react to them. We also talk about patient and family teaching and how to include them in the plan of care. And then pain management and infection prevention. We actually have clinical experts from the vascular access and wound care departments come to seminar to speak with our residents. And then the last area we talk about is under the professional role. And here we talk about stress management and self-care. And this really is from a well-being perspective. What we know is that for each person, this looks a little bit differently. And so we wanna make sure that each resident has strategies to take with them that work for them and they can apply for themselves so they are able to care for themselves, especially during this first year. We have end-of-life discussions and we also have an evidence-based practice project which we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit. Um, this is presented, uh, worked over several sessions within seminar and then presented at the end. And then we spend some time strengthening your professional commitment to nursing under that professional development. And here we assist with formulating an individual development plan, um, what the future holds for the resident, where do they see themselves in the next two to five years? And then we provide exposure to some of these um, aspects that they're interested in and then make sure that they can get on the right path to achieve those goals. So let's talk about now how we do all this work. 
So our program structure consists of clinical orientation, collaborative check-ins, program seminars, and an evidence-based practice project. So there are many layers to support a safe and successful transition to independent practice. And this is what drives our program. So let's take a look at these. So the first layer is about orientation. And here, um, as I mentioned earlier, we offer 350 plus hours of clinical orientation with a trained preceptor. We use a tiered preceptor model approach, which is called TSAM. Um, each tier builds on the previous. And so the resident will care for all the patients in their patient care assignment, but only focusing on the skills within that tier. So depending on the specialty that you were hired into, it will really determine the length of your orientation. And again, our goal is really that safe transition to independent practice. The second layer or category is under collaborative check-ins. And so here, the nurse residents are followed with a supportive and collaborative check-in approach, which occurs over the course of the residency program. So a member of the NRP team will collaborate with your unit leadership to follow your progress during the program and offer support when and where needed. We'll celebrate your successes, and then we'll help you identify opportunities for refinement. And when necessary, we'll come up with an action plan to help support the successful transition to independent practice. Our third category is with seminars. So seminars are facilitated by the NRP faculty. Again, not to reach each nursing school, but to integrate those concepts and support your development and teach you how to apply those at the bedside. And then lastly is our evidence-based practice project. So all residents are required to complete an evidence-based practice project. Um, it's been very thoughtfully designed to support the development and critical thinking um, and clinical reasoning skills of the individual. Program topics are aligned with specialty areas and residents are supported by the nurse residency program faculty as well as CNS coaches. The projects are presented at the end of the residency in the cohort as well as at the unit level. And depending on the type of project, it may be uh, featured in another presentation that is within the organization. So as much as we wanna recruit amazing clinical nurses, we also wanna keep you and grow you. Stanford Healthcare is uniquely capable of providing many opportunities for professional development. We are committed to growing and developing our clinical nurses from the moment they enter the nurse residency program and throughout their career. So if we walk through a few of these examples here, um, once the resident promotes to a clinical nurse position, and that happens around the six month mark, they will have access to tuition funds, and those could be used towards maybe formal education opportunities. Also could potentially be used towards continuing education opportunities. Maybe you're interested in a specialty certification that could be applied to that. We also have hospital wide and unit level committees that you can participate in, becoming a clinical expert possibly transition to practice opportunities, perhaps being a critical care nurse is one of your dreams. And currently you're working in the oncology area. Well, there are program uh, practice, transition to practice opportunities so that you can get into those and make those dreams happen. We also offer mentorship and clinical ladder promotions, career advancement. There are tons of opportunities. So this is a list of the hiring units for our next cohort. Our goal is to hire 100 nurse residents. However, this number can fluctuate sometimes depending on the needs of the organization. So Stanford is a specialty hospital. So the specialties are broken down into critical care, oncology, medical, and surgical regions. In our surgical AAU specialties, we have, for example, cardiac surgery, biliary, trauma. In the trauma AAUs, I'm sorry, the medicine AAUs, we have neurology and advanced lung disease, and also cardiac medicine. Oncology has hematology, bone marrow transplant, and then general oncology units. So this gives you an example of some different units that are within these AAUs. Now you might be wondering what's an AAU. An AAU stands for Acuity Adaptable Unit. So in other hospitals, you might hear the term med surge, uh, intermediate, or maybe progressive care units. So what sets Stanford apart from other hospitals is our ability to adapt to the patient's need when outside of the critical care areas, the AAUs can care for patients from acuity and acute care perspective, which is five to one, or an intermediate of three to one. So for example, if you have a patient in the acute care environment and that patient requires more frequent interventions, more frequent monitoring, maybe they require telemetry, um, what we can do is we can actually flex. And so 
what happens there is that the patient stays on that unit and then we change the, the level of care of that patient to an IIC, so three to one assignment. So the patient who has already built relationships with the staff there will stay on that unit and receive the care that they require without having to transfer to another department. So it saves both time and energy and also maintains patient and staff satisfaction. Our float pool serves surgical, medical, and oncology AAUs. This is also where the training takes place. So depending on the needs of the unit and the organization on any given day, that nurse would float to that area in need. In total, the critical care region will likely hire six residents. Surgery, medicine, and oncology units will hire approximately 30 each, while float pool will hire approximately two. I share this with you so that you can make an informed decision as to your preferences on the application. If you have a limited or no clinicals in the ICU, for example, knowing that they're only hiring six, maybe your first choice would be one of the AAUs. So let's talk a little bit about our specialty training programs. So within the nurse residency, we have critical care transition program and then the oncology student transition to practice program. All nurse residents participate in the nurse residency program. This program requires your full commitment and seminar participation is mandatory. Depending on the specialty area that you were hired into, you may be participating in additional programs to support your transition to practice. So currently for those residents who are hired into the ICU and oncology will participate in additional training, which may consist of in-person classes, virtual training sessions, simulation sessions, skills, and online learning. So for example, the critical care transition to practice program consists of monthly classes, simulation, skill session, and 80 hours of online learning in addition to the residency program. The Oncology Transition to Practice program includes online modules with a focus on chemotherapy, classes, and chemotherapy-specific orientation that start around a six to nine month part of your orientation. Again, we share this information to be fully transparent and so that you can make an informed decision when you apply. We want you to be aware of what the expectation is, so when you choose your identified specialty, we want you to feel supported in your growth and development, but we also don't want you to feel surprised. So here is a timeline for our next cohort. So this is cohort 40. I'm gonna draw your attention to a few specific dates here. So the first star, that's for uh, October 30th, which is in just a few weeks. This is when our application posts. It will be open for two weeks and that will be your opportunity to put in all your information and apply to the program. We'll then spend about a week uh, with application cleanup and another six weeks screening the applications that we read personally ourselves. Beginning on January the 29th, we'll begin our panel and then followed by unit level interviews. And then HR will go with final offers beginning on February the 9th. The last star that I wanna draw your attention to here is the third one, and that's the date of February the 16th. So this is when you must have obtained your California RN license. So not when you've applied to take the test, not when you're waiting for the test, but you've already applied for and taken your test and received your results that you have passed and have that in hand as of February 16th, 2024. So let's get into the application itself because I'm sure you have a lot of questions about what that entails and how to be successful. So you must be a graduate of an accredited nursing program with either your bachelor's, bachelor's or associate degree. You cannot have full-time six months working experience as a registered nurse. And if you do, we welcome you to apply to our clinical nurse two positions. Transcripts cannot be more than 18 months from the cohort start date. So our cohort start date is March 18th of 2024. Now, understanding that come a few weeks from now, you might not have graduated from your program. Transcripts that are official or unofficial are fine. Required documentation. Let me... Sorry, skip forward a little bit. So the required term is documentation. We're gonna kind of walk through that on the next slide. But here again, I wanna just reinforce that unofficial um, transcripts are fine. Again, they must not be more than 18 months from the start date of the cohort. All right. And then you must have graduated from an accredited ADN BSN or MSN program. So let's break down the required application documentation. So again, we've talked about transcripts. 
You'll also need a cover letter and resume. We'll talk a little bit about those in the next couple slides. Um, be sure that you have at least two references from a school of nursing faculty. And then our recommendation is that you have everything on one PDF or in one Word document. There are, as you can tell, multiple components to the application that you will have to un upload. So in the event that there was an issue or some kind of technology thing going on, if you have it in one document, that will make it much easier for you um, to upload everything at one time and easier on our end so that we can ensure that we see all of your required documentation. So in terms of the cover letter itself, the main purpose of a cover letter is to support the content of your resume. Your resume focuses on all of your qualifications and your achievements, as well as past experiences. Your cover letter will expand on those achievements and really showcase your personality and explains why you'd be a good fit for our organization. It gives us insight into your soft skills. So again, those motivations, those skills, and those attitudes of yours. On your cover letter, you may choose to share a few different things, like why you cho chose to pursue nursing and what motivated you. What have you done to get to this point? And what makes you uniquely qualified for this role? If you think back to all of your experiences, your personal experiences, your professional experiences, your clinical rotation, your education, volunteer, military, all these different experiences you've had, what makes you qualified? And then why Stanford? What are you looking for from our organization? And then what do you have to offer? And think about what you want to accomplish in the future and maybe how that aligns. With everyone writing about many of the same things, we encourage you to make time to be thorough and take this opportunity to really shine and show your individual goals. So in terms of your resume, think of it as a personal marketing tool. This allows us and you to effectively and clearly communicate your assets to a potential employer. We get a lot of questions about resumes and cover letters, particularly about format length and you know, what should and shouldn't be on it. So on this slide, we have listed all the things that should be on your resume. So let's walk through these for just a moment. So in terms of your education, you wanna make sure that you're including all of your nursing education, the degrees, dates, um, you want to make sure that you also include non-nursing. We get a lot of questions about that. We want to know, you know, is this, you know, part of another degree? Were you on a different track? We want to know about all of that. In terms of your clinical rotations, be sure to include all the information as it relates to the rotation. So if this was a labor and de delivery rotation, this was your critical care rotation, make sure you include the location of where that was and then the number of hours that you spent there. Work experience, military experience, and volunteer experience. Make sure you include the job title or role that you were in, uh, who your supervisor was or employer, the amount of time. So was it that, that, you know, January of 2023 to August of 2023? Share all that with us. And then include your roles and responsibilities. With volunteer experience, what we also ask you to add is the amount of hours that you have volunteered for. So one hour of volunteer experience is very different than 100 hours. So make sure that you include that. Otherwise, we cannot score that aspect of the application. We also want you to include any nursing internships and externships, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So again, same as work experience, you're gonna put what your title or role was, who your supervisor was, uh, the amount of time for that internship, so those dates, and then your roles and responsibilities. And then lastly, include your references. So a minimum of two from your School of Nursing faculty. All right, contact information is all that we are requiring on this. We don't need anything more than that. And for now, the application. So when you start the application, you're going to start with just some demographic data. Then you're going to ask about, or the application will ask you where you heard about the program, will you be committed to one year, and then some other yes and no's. You'll then be asked to do some specialty ranking, as you see on the left-hand side here. So in this situation, we want you to tell us what is your first preference, second, third, and so forth. So for example, if critical, critical care is your first preference, you're going to simply put critical care, number one, and then number two is so on, number three, and on and on and on. So if you only want, let's say it's float pool, so float pool would be your number one, and then potentially oncology is your number two. So just, you're gonna wanna rank those in terms of your preference, taking into consideration the information we've already shared. 
Your electronic application will also require you to answer four questions. Each question will have multiple components and you'll be required to answer all components of the question. The length of the answer is up to you. We accept all answers regardless of length. We're gonna go over those questions shortly and I wanna just mention that these are the items that are gonna be scored the most. So for those of you who weren't able to participate in some extracurricular activities, then this next portion or session is gonna be most important to you. And so these will have a great impact on your application. So let's take a look at that. In terms of the application questions, they're basically gonna be broken down into three aspects. It's describing the situations, what happened or what did you do? And then what was the result? What changed in your clinical practice? And this is what we will focus on when we're scoring this question. So let's look at this first one. Tell us about a time in your clinical rotation when you experienced a caring moment with a patient. It's the first part. How did this moment affect the patient's outcome? And how has this changed your clinical practice? So those are the three questions. And you'll see that we bolded, how has it changed your clinical practice? Because that is where we're focusing. So if we look below here in part one, some examples could be, you sat with a concerned family member. Maybe you washed and salved the patient's hair in anticipation for their family coming. Or maybe you made a patient laugh during a stressful moment. The second aspect is how did the how did you um, how did this impact the patient? So when you think about the um, concerned family member, the family member was relieved and felt calm after. Maybe the patient verbalized feeling refreshed and beautiful, and were smiling when their family member came. Or maybe the patient said they haven't laughed that hard in a long time, and it felt really good. So think about how you would answer this question. Again, this doesn't have to be this momentous occasion, this big thing. It can be very simple, but it's all about what you got from it and what that result was and what, what in your practice changed. So again, all the components need to be answered. They can easily be answered with one-liners, but again, what's going to make you successful is that impact that you had on the patient in your practice. So when you think about that, what did you learn from this in, um, interaction? Where do you see yourself now? How has this moment taught you, or what has this moment taught you about the human to human connection? And how has your viewpoint shifted, from maybe patient centered to human centered? So really take your time to answer these because it could be the difference between an average answer and an excellent answer. So I have an example and I'm gonna share one with you first, okay? So you have a sense of what we're kind of talking about here. A time during my clinical rotation that I experienced a caring moment was in my pediatric metric medical surgical rotation. My patient's mother was visibly upset due to the recent diagnosis of her son. I acknowledged her feelings by asking if she was okay and needed anything. She said she felt overwhelmed and very alone in navigating her son's recent health journey. I took the time to sit with her, giving her my attention and time. I listened to her concerns and validated her feelings. She thanked me for my time and attention and compassion. I now make a point to sit with my patient or their family when they are stressed. So that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Now, let me give you another example with a similar, same situation really. A time during my clinical rotation when that I experienced a caring moment was in my pediatric medical surgical rotation. My patient's mother was visibly upset due to her recent diagnosis that her son received. I acknowledged her feelings by asking if she was okay and needed anything. She said she felt overwhelmed and very alone in navigating her son's recent health journey. I took time to sit with her, giving her my attention and time. I listened to her concerns and validated her feelings. She thanked me for my time, attention, and compassion. This moment shaped me into the nurse I am today. I now make an intentional effort to be present and available to my patients with each interaction. When my patients or families are speaking to me, I limit distractions, ensuring that I'm not documenting or implementing care, but rather giving them my full attention with the hope that they will feel respected, valued, and heard. While I have always responded to outward behaviors of stress and worry, like crying or sadness or exhaustion, I have learned that in this moment that I need, um, that I will need to now um, be aware of those subtle behaviors so that I can stress or not be as stressed or worried. 
Since no two patients or family are the same, I know proactively to ask patients and their families, how are you? And can I do anything for you? Or do you have any concerns that have not been addressed? While I may not have the answers to every question, I can, at a minimum, start the conversation and find an appropriate resource to answer their questions. I also strive to meet their patients and their families where they are, meaning I address their current needs, stressors, or worries before moving on to medications, interventions, or plan of care for the day. I know by doing this, my patients and their families will be fully engaged in their care as their personal needs were prioritized. This caring moment not only impacted my patient's mother, but also transformed the way I deliver compassionate care, therefore impacting numerous patients and their families. So you can see that these two answers are similar. It's the same situation, but answered very differently with a very heavy impact on how it's changed your clinical practice. I also want to suggest and recommend that when you're answering these questions, that to say, tell us about a time during your clinical rotation when you've experienced a caring moment with the patient. A caring moment that I experienced with my patient was, how did this moment affect the patient's outcome? This moment affected the patient's outcome by, and how has it changed your clinical practice? This moment changed my clinical practice through by fill in the blanks. So really make sure those sentences are complete and that we aren't having to try and tease these out. If we can't find them, we can't grade them and score them. So I hope you're really able to hear those differences and that you now have a better understanding of how to spend your time answering the third and most important component of these questions. So I wanna share the rest of the questions with you. So we spoke about the first question. Now let's talk about the other three. So tell us about a time when you had an error in judgment. This can be personally, professionally, or academically. What happened? And then what did you learn from this experience? And how has it changed or shaped you into the nursing professional that you are today? Again, we're focusing on that last aspect. Tell us about a time when you provided community service. What type of service did you provide? So maybe you helped a neighbor. Maybe you volunteered at a homeless shelter. Maybe you were coaching a youth sports team. Think about how you have, how has serving a community prepared you for a profession that is committed to compassionate service. And then lastly, successful completion of a nursing program requires hard work, persistence, dedication, and resilience. Share with us what initially motivated you to pursue a career in nursing. What goals did you set for yourself? And what obstacles did you overcome to achieve those goals? Now, we're not going to grade your what motivated you and what your goals were and what your obstacles, those are yours. And we're not going to, we're not going to score those. However, what we're looking at is the hard work, persistence, dedication, and resilience that it took to get you where you are today. So think about what makes this experience memorable. Think about how did you go above and beyond? How much reflection and learning occurred as a result of this experience? Were there any lessons learned? Did you share and emphasize how to use this experience beyond nursing? How has a journey to this point shaped you into the person you are, how you act, how you perform? And then do you demonstrate a growth mindset that is evident in your response? So if you're wondering, what's a growth mindset? So growth mindset basically means that people who have this mindset, that even if they're struggling with certain skills, certain abilities, that with time and hard work, that those can be developed and they can achieve their goals. So that's what that means. So when preparing your application, refer to these questions and think about some experiences and scenarios that you could use, brainstorm, write them down. And when looking at that third component, take time to ask yourself those reflective questions that I was just going through. So I wanna go over some general questions. So there's cover letter and there's resume. Um, I'm gonna walk through, we often hear about these um, towards the end. So we wanna make sure that we take a moment and kind of walk through these and answer them. So how long should a cover letter be? I would say it should be no longer than one to two pages at the most. What about the format? The format is up to you. So uh, Word has many great templates. Google has many great templates. So that's up to you. Who should I address the cover letter to? You can address it to the nurse residency program. Uh, does Stanford read each cover letter or do they use any software application to scan for keywords? Well, wouldn't that be nice? We do not have that. We read each and every one of them. And actually, we enjoy reading them. Um, it really gives us insight into who you are as individuals 
And we love when we're able to finally connect that individual to the application um, on the first day. Um, should my cover letter target a specific position, um, specialty area that I'm interested in? It's not necessary. You do that within the application, but it's absolutely you can. Should I share my work experience even if they are not healthcare related? Absolutely. Much um, work experience translates to healthcare. So when you are a barista, when you are a bartender, if you are working as a waitress, um, any of those roles where you are practicing time management and prioritization and delegation and communication, customer service, all of those translate to nursing. It's just different words. Should I share my senior preceptorship experience even if it was not in adult medicine? Yes, absolutely. We want to hear about all of it. Should I share why I think I would be an asset to your organization? Or does this come off as bragging? It does not come off as bragging. We want to know why you think you should be here and working with us. Um, the hiring managers will be looking at this. So I want to encourage you to share this with us. How long should a resume and what format is it? Or is it wanted? So the resume, again, I would say just one to two pages. Formatting, again, is up to you. We um, shared earlier the information that we want on the resume. So you'll just want to make sure that whatever format you choose, that that information can be shared on that. How should I format the clinical rotation information? Um, again, that's up to you. We just want to make sure that it's on there. So um, our recommendation is just simply, um, you know, a single line for each rotation, pediatric rotation. These are the dates. These are the hours. This is the location. And so just keep it all together. We just need to be able to identify it and see it. Um, what do I put if I'm still completing my clinical hours? You can simply just put that there in progress. Do you give extra points for attending certain nursing schools like GPA or degree? We do not. Do you give any extra points if you had a clinical at Stanford Healthcare? We do not. However, we do note that you did have a clinical at Stanford. That helps us actually um, in terms of you know reaching out to the hiring manager and potentially placing you on that interview panel since you have an established relationship with that department or um, leadership team. Should I list non-healthcare related work experience? Uh, yes, I think we answered that before. Um, is all volunteer work acceptable? Um, yes, pretty much. Um, you know, you wanna make sure that this is, you know, stuff that you've done as an adult, I would say. Um, sometimes we hear about volunteering experience that was done when you were like four years old. Um, so we want to know about your independent, self-motivated volunteering experiences. And again, make sure you include those hours. What is considered an internship or ex externship? So a nursing internship is externship is really an, uh, an experience that is outside of your clinicals. Um, it's also related to nursing. So sometimes people will do internships or externships in other fields. Those that will not count. But if it was within nursing, if it's outside of your clinical hours, outside of your capstone, um, a lot of these are paid, sometimes they're unpaid, and then you'd have to apply for it. So that's how you would know this is an internship or externship. And then there's also always an end date. So it's not gonna just be this open-ended situation. There will be a, a cutoff at some point. Should I provide my RN license information? So um, we don't need you to upload anything like a certificate or anything like that. Um, on the application, there is a spot, I believe, where you can put that in. Um, should I provide my ACLS and BLS? No, that is not necessary. You do not need to do that. We will need it before you are um, um, at the time of being hired. You will need to have that information, but we don't need it on the application. Can I list other uh, elements on my resume, such as skills, certifications, or accomplishments? Absolutely. You can absolutely list them on your resume. However, we do not need those up uploaded on the application. So a few more questions here. So general application. So can I apply before I graduate from my ADN, BSN, or MSN program? Absolutely. So know that the program start date is um, March the 18th. So just know that you will have to have basically graduated by December um, so that you have enough time to take and sit your, for your test and pass before that date, okay, which is February the 16th. Um, can I apply before I have my RN license? Yes, I think we were kind of just answering that. When do I need to have my RN license by? We've talked about that a few times. The date is February 16th, 2024. You guys probably know that. 
Um, what is the interview process like? So um, we'll get into that. We actually have an interview preparation webinar that I will encourage you guys all to come to. It's in January. Um, it consists of, um, we'll start with a panel interview, and then should you um, be offered the opportunity to sit for a unit level, um, that will look a little bit different. The panel will be um, yourself and four other candidates. We will ask um, for questions, four or five questions, including introducing yourselves. The hiring managers will be there. Um, depending on how you do with that, you may be invited to a unit level interview. The unit level interviews are generally in person, so something to be mindful of. Um, in that timeline that we um, shared earlier, you'll want to be mindful of those dates so that you can be sure to be present for that. How many people are you hiring? Well, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is always to hire 100 individuals, but that can fluctuate depending on the organizational need at the time the cohort's starting. If I have applied before but not selected for, can I apply again? Absolutely. Just keep in mind those dates that we gave you before in terms of transcripts and work experience. Can I choose only one specialty? Yes. If you want to put all of your eggs in that one basket and you are only here to be hired into the critical care region, you put that as your number one, you leave the rest blank. Can I interview for more than one specialty? So you will only be interviewing for one specialty. Um, the hiring managers will at that point determine whether or not you are a fit for their unit or not. Uh, can I have another job? So the nurse residency program is a very rigorous program. So I would say that having another job would be very difficult and challenging. Um, you cannot work in, so if you were, let's say a, a nursing assistant um, and now you are finishing school, you're gonna become a nurse and you'll be working at Stanford. You can't be working as a nursing assistant in one place and an RN in another place. So we recommend just one job. Um, is it manageable to be enrolled in a BSN bridge program? It is. It's a lot of work. Um, it's going to require a lot of determined determination. It's going to require a lot of prioritization um, and maybe delegation on behalf of your family. But yes, it is absolutely manageable. We um, Every cohort, we have the majority of our um, residents who are in associate degree, for example, um, transitioning for the BSN bridge, the majority of them are all in the bridge program and managing it. Um, what if I have planned vacation during the first month or two of the program? Um, so I would say that that's going to be very challenging for you. You'll be on orientation. It is not good timing. And now that you know the program timeline, I would suggest that you adjust those dates so that you are free and very much present for your orientation. All right, so a few reminders, and then we'll be getting to the Q&A session here in a few moments. So um, application checklist. So you're gonna make sure that you have your transcripts, either official or unofficial. You're gonna make sure you have your cover letter, your resume. You're gonna to wanna to include all the information here on your screen on the left-hand side. And then you're gonna to wanna to ensure that you complete your electronic application. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you do not have to submit um, your RN license, but you are required to have it by February the 16th. Um, you want to make sure that you have um, BLS and ACLS, but again, it's not needed for the application, but it is required for hire. Um, you do not need to submit or upload any additional certifications or letters of recommendation. We ask that you apply only one time. If you are concerned that there was an error in the application process, we're going to ask that you email newgradrn at stanfordhealthcare.org and state what the error is. And then we're going to ask you to wait. They will respond. So please just understand that they will be getting probably many emails and they're going to want to respond to yours individually. So give them a moment to, to respond. Be mindful of the application window and do not wait till the last minute to apply. Late applications will not be accepted. So you might try and say that you were having technology issues or something else was going on. Late applications will not be accepted. Um, and again, you wanna try and do all this at the beginning. So knowing when that application opens, you now know all the things you'll need. It's a great time to just start preparing. Please only use one identifier that remains consistent on all documentation. So resume, transcripts, and applications. So if your name is Samantha and you go by Sam, but your transcripts say Samantha, we're going to ask that on your resume, your application, and all the documentation, it says Samantha. This just helps to keep it clean and simple on our end so we're not confusing with 
one Sam and one Samantha for another, okay? Um, let's see, applications that do not have all the required documentation will be um, rejected. And then as a reminder, make sure you answer all application questions. Don't leave anything blank. So some salary and relocation information that you might be highly interested in. So our base rate starts at 81.69 per hour. Then on top of that, there are shift differentials for evening, nights, and weekends. So it's very competitive. Um, we also offer relocation assistance up to $5,000 for um, those coming from out of the area. Um, we also have PTO that actually starts on your um, day of hire. So 36 days in the first year, and then after 10 years, it increases to 39. We offer um, comprehensive and competitive medical, dental, and vision plans. Um, there are three plans in total that you are actually able to choose from. We also offer tuition reimbursement um, up to $1,800 um, that you can use to also pay back student loans. Um, we require that all Stanford Healthcare employees um, be vaccinated, boosted, and be able to show proof of that. And then as one last and final reminder, our cutoff date for the Calif to have your California license is February 16th. 2024. So with that, I want to thank you for your time today. Now, before you start in the chat, you might have lots of questions. I'm going to ask you to keep hanging on to those for just a little bit longer. Um, we have some residents here that I want to introduce first um, and give them an opportunity to share, um, tell them a little bit about themselves, to introduce themselves, and then what made them successful. And then I'll open it up so that you guys can actually ask them some questions. So we have... Um, Naima, Mo, and Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to come on first and maybe just introduce yourself and then what made you successful in the application? Of course. Hi, good afternoon or good morning still, everyone. My name is Vanessa Diaz. Um, I graduated from De Anza, so I currently have my associate's degree in nursing. Um, and I feel like what really made me successful um, in my application process um, was preparation. I sat down right after the webinar and I wrote down all of the memorable experiences that I had during my clinical practice. Um, you know, a time I advocated for a patient or dealt with a difficult patient. And I felt like that was very helpful. And I kind of just really sat through and methodically, you know, worked out like, why and how and what I did and how it affected me um, and just working on those application questions because there are multiple components to it getting a head start on that is going to really help you be successful overall thanks Vanessa thank you may, may I see you do you want to share hi um, I'm Naima it's nice to be with you all today I graduated from a small school in Reading called Simpson University I got my BSN there and then I um, applied to Stanford. Um, I'd say similar to Vanessa, I did the same thing after this webinar. I found it extremely helpful just because I'm a very organized person and I like to be able to have enough time to prep myself for an application like this. Um, I also gathered a lot of my stories from my clinical experience and also like my volunteer experience too because I thought that would be helpful to um, elaborate on during the interview process and I just wrote out in my own words like everything that happened it was I probably had like a six or seven page document <laughs> just the different stories and towards um, when the interview got closer I kind of kind of um, minimized how many stories I had and utilized my best ones I felt like were personal to me that I felt like I could be my best self in, if that makes sense. So I didn't feel fake because <laughs> I wanted to be genuine. So um, I found that just like really, really preparing and taking time to like go over these stories and like really find heart in it and like make sure that you're not, you know, trying to like be something that you're not because the first interview is with four people and it can be intimidating to be with other people and hearing other stories, but stick with your story and believe in it and it's it's probably going to be good and people are going to like it you won't you know you probably get in your head but just realize that you're probably in your head about it so that's my advice for that thanks Naima. Mo. hi everyone my name is Monique but I go by Mo um kind of same thing that Vanessa and Naima said preparation is key I felt like this was this was actually Stanford was my first interview after graduating 
So there was a lot on the line. Um, it was Stanford or nothing, essentially. And I used a lot of my like care plans, my journals that we did in school to compile all of my uh, scenarios and stories for the application. Um, and I remember, you know, Christy and Letty and Carrie, they all emphasized in the application webinar, like focused on that part three of the questions. So that's kind of like where I put most of my work into. Um, you know, I, I talked about my scenario, you know, what was the scenario? How did it, did it impact the patient? But I made sure to really focus on what did it do to change my own clinical practice? And I just kept revising, revising, revising as best as I could um, and utilizing, you know, um, nursing instructors to kind of review my application, friends to review my application, and then reading it out loud as well, just to make sure it sounds like me. Um, like Naima said, like not wanting to be fake, not wanting to um, be this kind of like cookie cutter version of, of who I am. I really wanted to show who I was in my application. And I also had like a six, seven page document. So <laughs> it, and just cut it down from there. Thanks, Mo. Great advice, ladies. I appreciate your time today. So um, I'd like to open it up. Who has some questions for our nurse resident? You can go ahead and use your virtual hand and then I'll just kind of call on you. Uh, Brianna, I see that your hand's up. Sorry, I'm being technically challenged right now. Hi, okay. so well, okay. it's afternoon here. Hello from Chicago. I do have a quick question and it isn't for the residents, but I do want to thank them for their time. But it's actually for you. For the transcripts, um, are you guys wanting just our nursing transcripts? to be uploaded in the application or is it the transcripts with all of our prerequisites like our biology and anatomy and chemistry and stuff like that? So it's just the, um, the nursing transcript that you guys are requiring for the application yeah. or is it everything? And I'm asking because of that 18 month um, situation that that time constraint. That specifically for nursing. Carrie and Lady, is that correct? Make sure I, I'm giving you the right information. Can you repeat that part? Sorry, we were, Sorry, we were answering, we were in, the answering in the chat. <laughs> she wanted to know about the transcripts and just ensuring that um, from the nursing perspective, if there were any like her ex, um, like general ed stuff, um, if that can be outside of the 18 months. It's And it's just mostly nursing, right? That's what we're mostly focused on. Yeah, so nursing degree. So if you did like prerequisites a long time ago, but you're in a associate degree program or a current bachelor's program, we only want nursing program um, transcripts. Yep. And those are the only ones where it's graduation to cohort start date cannot exceed 18 months. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna. All right. Uh, Fatima, I think I saw your hand up next. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fatima. The question I had was regarding um, uh, like relocation and traffic, I feel like in the Bay Area that can kind of be a little bit difficult. And I wanted to ask new graduate residents if they recommend any cities to live in or anything that would help with that commute. Great Thank you. question. Uh, Vanessa, Mo, Naima. I can answer that. that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's also contingent on your shift, you know, um, what you work, if you're going with the flow of traffic. I personally live in Sunnyvale um, and our start time during the day is 645. So for the most part, you beat traffic. But, you know, the more south and with traffic you go at the end of your day, it can get a little bit sticky. So I feel like a lot of people, Palo Alto, Mountain View, Redwood City, um, Sunnyvale, those aren't too bad um, in regard to traffic during the day and night, but it kind of just depends on your shift, really, you know, the flow of traffic. So, but yeah, all the neighboring cities are really nice and, you know, yes, it's a little bit pricey, but, you know, it's, it's worth it. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, April, do you have a question for our residents? Hello, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sometimes my mic doesn't work. Sorry, my my uh, camera doesn't work right now. 
Um, I had a question about if, and thank you for your time. Um, I was wondering if you have been a patient or a caregiver at Stanford, if it's appropriate to include these experiences um, in your essay responses, if they've Yeah, I think it's absolutely um, appropriate. If you feel comfortable with sharing and being vulnerable, I think that's absolutely your decision. And if you want to share that, it's perfectly fine. Thank you. Yeah. Eileen? So I wanted to ask, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So I wanted to ask um, our nurse residents, um, so Naima Mo um, and Vanessa, um, when you started, can I ask what um, unit did you initially pick? And um, can you kind of give me like a, a quick rundown of like what to expect, let's say like the first, I don't know, the first 90 days when you started? Thank you. Uh, Naima, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so when I, I think if I remember correctly, I'm sorry if I don't, because I feel like it was a long time ago, but um, I think you get like, you get to pick your top three, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I picked about three or four specialties, I believe. Um, but when you do the first interview, I think they choose, like, you don't get to pick, I think, which one you, because they, they separate them in sections, I believe. So it's like AAU part one or part B, or I don't remember, but I think there's like different specialties within those ones that they like do for the panel interviews. Um, but I didn't, I just received an email like saying I was gonna be interviewing for that specific section. Um, and then some of the ones that I picked, cause I think I picked cardiology, which is actually what I'm on now. Um, and I picked, I think, I think pulmonary and a couple other ones as well. Um, and then I ended up interviewing for that panel and then um, after that, that's when they, the hiring managers, like they said in the process, like pick which one, but you don't get, I don't think you get a say in who picks you. They just pick you. And then I was like, I, I honestly was okay with anything because, you know, it's Stanford and I just wanted to get in. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so they picked me and I got my interview. And then after I got my, are you talking about the 90 days after you get hired? Is that what you're talking about? Or just like, yes. pre yeah. Okay. So, so. Oh gosh. Um, I got hired and then I think you get an email from HR and they tell you basically everything that like you need to do before you can like be like fully set. Um, and like they're very, like they have a person working with you um, to get all the documentation you need or whether it's your license, the BLS, um, ACLS, things like that. So it's very, like they have a timeline for you of everything. So like the first like 90 days was very like detailed, which I, I really appreciated. Um, and I had always someone there to like ask questions if I needed clarification on things. Um, it is like, it's very time sensitive. Some of the things I think um, uh, with like getting, I think it's like getting your vaccine and um, getting your schedule for like doing your orientation, things like that. But like, I think all to say, cause there's a lot of details in it. I don't really want to like waste time on, but uh, I would say the first 90 days is pretty structured and I think like you'll have enough time to do things you just have to be really adamant about paying attention to the dates that they give you for certain things that they need from you um, and you and they're very good about answering your questions or clarifying things if things don't make sense with the material they give you once you get hired so that's what I can speak to that. Thank you. Yes. And I would confer it's it's the first 90 days are very much structured we give you a schedule and a calendar you're on orientation. Um, so it's, it's very structured. So thanks, Naima. And thank you for your question. Uh, Christine. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I just wanted to ask, so I'm currently working as an RN right now. However, I've only been working for, um, two months. Um, so I'm wondering for the application, I know it opens up in November. Are you counting it towards that November month where the cutoff date is for the six or are you... Uh, are we counting it towards the March start? March, this cohort start date. Okay, all right. Um, And I know it says six months on there, but I know previously it did say six months or a specific number of hours. Um, If I am um, below that specific number of hours, but not necessarily the six months, would it still count? 
Yeah. So for example, if you're working part-time potentially, then it might, that number would maybe fluctu uh, fluctuate a little bit. So what I would encourage you to do is um, that new R new RN, um, new grad RN email is to, you can address mm -hmm. that question very specifically there so that you can have confirmation on those hours. I believe it's also on our careers page too. It's kind of like mm -hmm. maybe three quarters of the way down, it kind of breaks that down for you a little bit more. Perfect. And one last thing. Um, so I finished with my ADN back in December of last year. So that still counts me under the six, the 18 months. Um, but I am going to be graduating with my BSN here in May. Um, which one, I guess what I'm trying to say is which one would, would be more priority for you guys? Would it be a BSN uh, like if, for example, I didn't get into this program, would it be the BSN um, graduation date or would it be my RN experience? Um, so we're not we're not going to prioritize whether you have an associate degree or a bachelor's or a master's. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not going to it's not you wouldn't not get into the program because of that. So mm -hmm. you'll just simply have your, you know, BS, you know, on your resume, you'll simply state that you have your associate degree. And that your bachelor's is in progress. Okay. Um, but overall, um, it's going to be the RN experience that's really going to determine if you're um, eligible for, for the specific graduate pro pro yes. program. Yes. Sounds like in your, in your, for your specific situation, yes. It sounds like the, the RN experience would be that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Is it Ida or Ada? Hi there. Hi. There. Hi. Uh, thank you guys for your uh, time. Um, I, I have a question towards uh, residents. Uh, if they can share their experience of interview, how was it? And well, well, I mean, if it's possible, what question usually ask? And <laughs> I don't know okay. if you can share that information. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll invite you to the interview um, webinar that is in January. So stay tuned and see our careers page for that. But Mo, do you want to speak to her question a little bit and just in terms of your experience? Yeah. So there's two interviews. You have your panel interview and then um, if invited uh, from one of the hiring managers on that panel interview, then you go in person. Uh, I'm not going to lie. The panel interview was kind of stressful. Uh, I had my Apple watch on and it kept giving me a notification. Your heart rate's 120. I was definitely tachycardic during that interview. Um, they, you know, ask you the basic questions, you know, tell me about yourself. Um, why do you want to be at Stanford? Um, and really, so you're on a panel with four other people, um, as Christy had mentioned before, and you each are asked the same question. It's kind of like a round, like a round robin. Um, you each are asked the same question, so you each have the opportunity to answer in the way that you need to. Um, and you have, I think, a minute to answer. Uh, that might, I, correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but you might have a minute to answer, so you kind of have to be concise. So when you're, uh, as you know, Vanessa and I, and I mentioned in the beginning, uh, when we introduce ourselves, preparation is key, whether it's for the application or whether it's for the interview. Um, you want to make sure that you have a list of scenarios. Uh, maybe I uh, trying to think the interview, the interview panel or the interview webinar is definitely going to give you more information, but they're going to have you maybe tell about a time that you had a caring moment, for example. Um, I use the star method. So you want to do situation. Um, what you did in that situation and of course how it impacted your uh your clinical practice practice that as much as you can and try to get it down under a minute um because then that will kind of help show you who you are I think there was one question that I had I was a little bit over a minute and one of the panelists like raised their hand and I freaked out I was like oh that's it I'm not going to be I'm not going to get hired I already messed up and then they gave us, I think, by 5 p.m. to tell us whether or not we made it on to the next round. And it was getting close to that 5 p.m. time frame. So I was I remember talking to my boyfriend and telling him, like, I guess I can apply to Stanford next year. And then the hiring manager called me like right at five and was like, oh, my gosh, we really want to see you. And I had an uh, in-person interview the next day. Um, and then the in-person interview, I felt like I did a lot better because I was able to show my personality. It was only myself and then the hiring manager. Um, the assistant patient care manager and then two 
previous nurse residents. So I was like, okay, cool. I got this. I can show my personality. I can use hand gestures. My heart rate was at a stable rate. Um, yeah, I feel like the, the in-person interview for me personally was way better than the panel, but it all goes back to just prep preparing. Um, and one of the, I think someone reached out to me via chat, kind of like what helped me stand out, just being yourself and being honest. Um, you can practice so many times, but sometimes practice doesn't make perfect. So when you're in the interview, whether it's the panel or whether it is the, um, the in-person, if you have to stop and compose yourself, just do that. Um, I had to do that during my in-person because I was like getting flustered. I was talking too much rambling and I could tell I was getting a little bit nervous and I could tell that I was losing interest in the panel or in my um, interviewee. So I just said, hey, is it OK if I stop? I took a breath and then I continued on. And my my uh, assistant care manager had told me like that was one of the things that impressed them in the interview. So thanks, Mo. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny Rose, question for our residents. Okay, thank you for holding this webinar. Uh, for the nurse residents, uh, can you guys briefly describe like your uh, unit culture and what are some things new grads can do to fit into that culture or fill in the holes that we want to improve on? Sure, thanks. Uh, Vanessa, would you like to take this one? Of course, yeah, great question, Jenny Rose. Um, so what, can you repeat it one more time just so I make sure I answer everything? Um, if you could briefly describe your unit's culture and as a new grad, what can you do to fit into that culture or fill the holes in the, for ways that you want to improve on? Okay, awesome. So for my unit, I work on a med onc unit and our culture, and I imagine most cultures on all units, but everyone is very caring and kind and mindful that you are new. And I think mindful is kind of a really great keyword that brought me a lot of comfort because I know I had imposter syndrome for so long, you know, like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? I'm never going to get this down. And everyone just went through everything very slow and concise and asked me questions. And I asked a lot of questions and it just kind of cultivated a really nice and supportive experience for me. I mean, even to this day, we're a little over six months in and I still have questions and I never feel like my questions are dumb or like, why are you still asking me this? You know, everyone is very kind in answering my questions um, and kind of cultivating that learning environment. And the second part of your question, it was kind of how to be successful or fill in the holes. Is that what so for me personally, just jumping into everything, you know, if there's a code and it's not your patient and you can kind of look at your preceptor and say, hey, can I go be a part of this? And it's, you know, appropriate. It's go be a part of it. You know, go see because in your preceptorship, you're not going to encounter everything, you know, so whatever you can kind of immerse yourself in. And even though you might feel apprehensive, do it because, you know, the only way to get comfortable is to get through being uncomfortable. Um, and so just really being open eyes, ears, and willing to help however you can, um, I feel like made me very successful. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Heather? Hi there. Um, okay, so I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this question, but um, it's kind of two parts. So where were all of you um, when you apply like where in your nursing journey like as far as were you done with school were you still in school when you decided to apply and then I know all of us will be asked this at some point but why Stanford I would kind of like to hear uh someone's uh answer to that that's gone through this process successfully sure uh Naima do you want to take that question I'll just kind of keep going in a row yeah um so when I applied to Stanford, I think I applied for the same like time period that you guys are in right now. So I was still in school when I applied because I think their application opened in October. So same, same timeline. Um, I, yeah, so I applied, yeah, as a student, um, I didn't have my license yet. 
Um, and then I think with the whole process with the school, my school had to send my transcripts and I had to get my authorization to test. And then I ended up taking my my NCLEX in January and passing. Um, and then I was able to, you know, be in the criteria of, you know, being able to get into Stanford. So that's where I was in my nursing journey um, to answer that first question. Second question, um, why Stanford? Um, I honestly, if I'm being honest, I didn't even like know I was gonna be applying to Stanford when I did. Um, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, but I, um, yeah, I, I had, I was like, oh, there's no way like I'm gonna ever like get into Stanford. It wasn't even something on my radar. It was my now husband who was like, you should try. And I was like, okay. And I did it kind of just to like prove to myself that I could get into a place like Stanford or um, be seen by Stanford. So it was kind of just like a challenging thing for me to kind of like see, am I like, can I actually do something like this? And I did, um, which so it got kind of affected like how I like my attitude like of like, oh, like I'm trying to prove something to myself kind of like guided me in like the interview process. Like it kind of just shaped kind of my whole attitude towards this application process and kind of how I structured it and how I answered questions. So it didn't like being like, oh, I don't know if I'll get in kind of like that attitude kind of made me. I guess more relaxed. I'd say I was I was stressed out, but not as stressed out as I could have been if I was like if Stanford was my number one choice because it originally wasn't. So um, I'd say like I chose I chose Stanford because like I I loved um, my the managers I spoke to who interviewed me were amazing. Um, I love that they're always trying to be innovative and they're always and I mean they're Stanford they're like one of the best hospitals to work at and they're like the people there were super super helpful even when I was like going there to get you know my stuff done people would stop me and see that I was lost because it's so big and this would be so helpful to me so I was just drawn to really the people and the culture of just wanting to um be kind and also just um like help you learn and get to achieve your goals as best they can so that's what I really loved about Stanford. They just, the people there are just really amazing and are the best really because Stanford hires the best in my opinion. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, so let's see, Tebow. did I say that correctly? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I might be a little special uh, because I've been listening to everybody speaking and I haven't um, seen uh, anybody maybe that falls under my own category. I am an international grad nurse, um, initially from Africa. And listening to all of you, I haven't seen anybody um, fall under uh, that category yet. Um, so my question is, have you all ever hired anybody um, that graduated overseas and came here and had their, their NCLEX? Um, and stuff like that. Have you ever hired anybody? Because I belong to that um, category of people. Um, even though when I came here, I had to do like some refresher courses, which I just graduated in December. I just had my NCLEX two months ago. So I'm just wondering, like, do you do I have a chance? So um, <laughs> great question. And thank you for asking it. I'm going to ask you to place that in the chat. And um, we have our um, HR partner here, and she can address that question for you directly. So I'm going to have you put that in the chat. Okay. I think I did. I did before. Okay, perfect. So they will, did she, did anyone get back to you yet? No. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Um, give them some time. And if they do not address you, because I think as I'm kind of looking, it looks like there's a lot of questions in the chat or a lot of chatter in the chat. Um, they, I will encourage you to email at newgradrn at Stanford Healthcare. And then they can email you back and address that directly. All right. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Mary, did you have a question for the residents? Yes, I do. Thank you. And as well as for you, if you don't mind. Um, thank you for holding this uh, um, webinar. Um, so my first question is for Mo. I have uh, two questions for her. Uh, she mentioned, uh, first, I, I want to clarify the inter the panel interview that she mentioned. Is it two panel interviews and then an interview in person with a unit manager, or is it one to one and one? One and one. Oh, one and one. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And then another question for Mo. Um, she mentioned earlier that um, she was able to, or she she shared her application to other people, such as the, her her instructors and some friends. And I just want to know how she was able to do that technically wise. Uh, yeah, great question. So I actually just use Google Docs um, for my application as well as my interview prep. Um, Google Doc, if you have not used it, is amazing because you can essentially you know, gather someone else. You can share the document to another person, assuming they're using Google uh, via email. Um, so I think it's Gmail you have to use. And then you, of course, you could also, if Google is not um, something that you're wanting to use or able to use, you can always like download your application or you can, you know, go old school, print it out and then give it to your instructor or whoever is going to be reviewing um, that's always helpful as well. Oh, so I hear you say you can actually download the application and share it to. Uh, so when I say download the application, um, I actually just create it for, for um, the way that I prepped. I just used a Google Doc. So all of the application questions, like tell me about a time you had a caring moment with a patient. I just typed that into my Google Doc and then wrote my application from there. or wrote my essay from there, not essay, but paragraphs from there. Um the other parts of the application, I don't think that you can download, like the supplemental, not the supplemental, like the demographic questions, those you can't download. What I was referring to is just the paragraphs. I see, I see. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Of course, of course. Thank you. Yeah, I have, oh, I'm so sorry. I have a no, question. Um, so two things. So the references. Um, so the faculty members I worked with at the school where I went, um, I'll no longer work for the school. And I was wondering if I can use them as one of my references. And if so, do I need to include in my um in my resume that they are no longer part of the school? Um, you will probably want to use current references. That would be my advice is to use current references. Um, and then include their contact information so that, you know, in the event the hiring manager did want to reach out that they could. Um, I believe that the requirements said two faculty members. Yeah, as long as they're, are they current though? You're saying they no longer work? They no longer work there though. They just, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would say that you would want them to probably still be there. So that way they can reach out and speak to you or current, like, if there's been a significant amount of time, then the, their experience with you may not reflect where you're at right now. Does that make sense? I just so, read June. Um, okay. So it's still kind of current, I would say. Um, okay. But, so they only left in the last couple few weeks, it sounds like. I Yeah. It's not too long ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then that's probably fine. As long as you have their contact information. Contact information. And it's okay for me to just uh, put in their um, personal contact information and not the school's? Um, if, if they're willing to share that, if that's okay with them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And mm -hmm. another question for you. Um, so I did the LVN program bridge to BSN and for the clinical rotation on my resume, do I have to include my LVN clinical rotations aside from my BSN clinical rotations? Um, I would include all of your clinical rotations so that we, because they might differ a little bit, you might be getting different experiences. So I would include all your clinical rotations. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Princess. Princess, did you have a question for our residents? Okay, we'll come back to you, Princess. We can't hear you if you're speaking. Um, let's see, uh, Katronia, did I say that correctly? Um, Catriona, but no problem. No one ever does. Okay. Cats, okay. Um, I was curious um, if the residents have, after, uh, it might be getting ahead of ourselves to assume we're going to get off to the point of after interviews, or. Um, but is there anything that you did to prepare yourself for your specific units? And if you guys are involved in either the oncology or the critical care, um, I don't even know what to call it, but we, there was those subsections for nurse residents, like the extra training, I guess. Um, are are any of you involved in that or do you have can you speak to that at all and what that extra time looked like as far as I assume you're working your um three twelves a week and then there's probably some additional commitment um and just what that looked like and what your experience was and if you found that you needed to do additional 
preparation to feel strong um, with that content. Sure. Uh, Vanessa, do you think you can take that one? Yes. Hi. Um, so I can speak to a portion of that just because my cohort hasn't started the transition to practice yet. We're going to start in February. However, I do have a coworker who just graduated from the program, but she was doing transition to practice. She was doing her bridge to BSN, including her clinical hours, and she was managing it all okay. So even extra, more extracurricular activities. Um, and she was managing it okay. So, and I know that the transition to practice, especially for oncology, I imagine critical care as well, but it's very helpful because it really breaks down, um, you know, why different chemotherapy drugs are helpful, what you do in instances of adverse reactions and things like that. So um, it might be a little bit extra, but overall, I think it really helps strengthen your foundation as a nurse, especially in your specialty. Um, and then, I'm so sorry, what was the first portion of your question? Do you find yourself, um, the time commitment outside or addition to your, uh, like, three twelves a week? Um, what does that look like? Are you spending a lot of time outside of work completing, like, additional modules or studying or something? I don't know. Oh, no, not at all. No, everything that we do NRP-related or clinically related, we do, you know, on, on site. So during our NRP seminars, anything that, that we work on, we, we work on while we're there. Um, and that's why they do kind of a lot the time that they do, um, you know, in the beginning, I think it's like twice a month. And then towards the middle, you kind of graduate to doing like one seminar a month. And, um, and it is, the, you know, your staff, your, your leadership do, do work with you to make sure that it's conducive um, with your clinical schedule. Um, but I, I don't feel like I have to do personally, I don't feel like I have to do anything, um, you know, extra outside in regard to studying, unless I guess if you had just additional questions about certain disease processes that you feel like are really common on your unit, and that's kind of, you know, at your discretion. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, Michelle, do you have a question? Uh, yes, um, good afternoon. Um, so I have a quick question regarding the, um, the licensing portion. So I'm currently in North Carolina and I did graduate from my nursing program in October. So, um, <laughs> two days ago <laughs> was mm -hmm. the official, um, like end date for my program. Um, so I was wondering, do you recommend me to get my NCLEX or my RN license here in North Carolina and then try and just get my license in California as well? Or would you recommend me to just get my California license and do it that way? Um, I think that is kind of a personal decision. Um, I think I will ask you to put that also in the chat. Um, because I think that if your goal is to get to California, then I would just go for your California license so that you aren't having to sit for your state's license and then have to worry about, you know, making that transition over to apply also for California. Christy, um, I'm just yeah. going to ask Michelle to put that in the chat. We get that a lot. And Carly from HR has a pathway that will help out of state license licensees. So it's expedited. So throw that in the chat and we can get you. All the right information. Sorry, Christy. Okay. No, that's Thank you. Yes. Yep. That's what I was suggesting too. Carrie, do you want to um come on and uh clarify a few things? And then um we are running out of time. It's 1226. So um we will answer, have Carrie clarify a couple things. I'll take one more question and then we'll have everybody um just email the new grad RN with the rest of your questions. Thank you guys Thanks, for your Christy. time. So we're getting um, a lot of the same questions in the chat. So we wanted just to kind of clarify a few things. In terms of who reads your application, do we have software or AI that reads your application? No, we have people, a team that will read every single cover letter, resume, and all of your transcripts and answers to your application. So we will read them. Question about RN work experience. So yes, we have a cutoff. You cannot exceed more than six months full-time hours of RN experience in any setting, acute care, non-acute care, community, SNF, 
et cetera. And the reason that is, is because in order to be a nurse residency program, you have to um, have your participants have minimal nursing experience in order to call yourself a nurse residency program. If you are currently working as an RN, or if at the time of hire or application, you have exceeded the six months full-time hours of RN experience, you are free and welcome to apply to any of our current postings on the Stanford Careers website. If you are currently working as an RN, but you are part-time, and at the time of hire, you will not have exceeded six months in hours, make sure you specify that on your resume, that your work is part-time work. So we know that likely you have not exceeded that time frame. Um, for those of you who are asking about pediatrics and OB and um, some of our affiliates like Valley Care, so Valley Care runs their separate um, nurse residency program, so please look at on their website if you're interested in working at um, Tri-Valley, which is in Pleasanton, formerly Valley Care, excuse me. And then Lucille Packer Children's Hospital, also known as Stanford Children's Health, is where the pediatric um, and mother baby and OB units are, and they run a separate nurse residency program. So if you're interested in pediatrics or OB or mother baby, please look at the Stanford Children's Health um, nurse residency program website about their, um, their program. References. So remember this, we do not want you to have to go chase down letters of recommendation. We don't require them and we do not read them. So do not ask anyone to write them for us because they take a lot of time. The only thing we're asking is a minimum of two clinical faculty from your school of nursing. So that is an individual who is hired by your school of nursing who oversaw your clinical. So that does not include a preceptor. A preceptor is hired at the hospital and is assigned to you, right? They do not work for your school of nursing. So your reference is a faculty member hired through your school of nursing who gives you your grade on your transcript who oversaw your clinical rotation. All we're asking is their contact information, email or phone number nothing else from them. No letters, please do not ask them to do that, just their contact information. Um, on the timeline that you saw, there is a section that says panel interview preparation. That is what we are doing. That is not for you. We spent some time prepping and reaching out to all of you for panel in interviews. That is nothing that you have to attend. We will send to your schools and do our social media postings about an interview preparation webinar, which you will all be invited to. But in terms of panel interview preparation, there's like a three to four week time frame that is for the individuals who work within our program to prep for the interviews. Um, we no longer have a COVID vaccine booster requirement. Santa Clara County just lifted that. So for those of you who had questions about that, there's no longer a COVID vaccine booster requirement. And then lastly, the 18th month timeline has caused some confusion. So we have a requirement that your school of nursing graduation date up until the date that the cohort starts cannot exceed more than 18 months. So if our cohort starts March 18th, you go back 18 months and you say, did I graduate within that 18 month time frame?" And if you did, great. If you graduated from an associate degree program and then you decided to go through the bridge program and you got your bachelor's, your graduation date is your most recent, which is your bachelor's program. So you can use that. In terms of transcripts, we want your entire school of nursing transcripts, not just 18 months, all of them. They may be incomplete, meaning you're still in school. And so your last quarter or semester is not there. That's totally fine. Just provide us unofficial transcripts from when you started to current. If you have graduated, then they will be completed. If you are, have done um, different programs, maybe you did a associate's degree and now you complete a bachelor's, you can submit both because they're going to be tied together. You do not need to submit prerequisites in order to start a program. So just think of what is considered my school of nursing, what is the degree I'm submitting. I want to make sure I have uh, transcripts that reflect that degree. Okay, hey, Christy, that's, that was it from us. Hope that clarified. All right. Thanks so much.
All right, so it is 1232. And unfortunately, we could not get to all of the questions. I really want to thank you all for coming today. I also want to uh, reshare with you. Um, let's see if I can find it here. I need to share. Almost there. I just want to share. Here it is. That's what you get for having too many windows open at one time. So I want to share with you um, our uh, from Dr. Hampton. So that way you know exactly um, about the program that she was talking to you about earlier in the study. The QR code is there if you still need it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that for anyone that who did not get an opportunity to ask their question and it was not addressed, that you can email the new grad RN at stanfordhealthcare.org and ask your question there. I, again, really appreciate the time of our residents. Thank you so much, Mo and Naima and Vanessa. Thank you for your time today. And I hope to see you all in the application process. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for putting this all together and for everyone's time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, everyone. Good Thanks. luck to you. Thank you.